Okay, I uh, just want to thank everyone for joining us. And I want to especially uh, thank Felicia for uh, taking time uh, from her Saturday afternoon to, to do this presentation for us. And then afterwards, we'll have a, a, a Q&A. Take it away, Felicia. So I'm probably preaching to the choir here uh, with all these humble fish people, but um, today I just kind of wanted to go over quarantine and conditioning for captive bred fish, um, you know, what's necessary, what's not, and ideally what we would all be doing anyway. Um, but I kind of grew up in the saltwater world in the uh, seahorse community and our community is a little bit different than you know the rest of the reefing community. We, we always kind of were extra with our conditioning and quarantining and just making sure our seahorses were you know conditioned and eating before going into the main bank and that was just the norm. It's what we all always did. Um, so it's definitely affected the way I keep all of my saltwater fish. Um, so it's true that captive bred fish are hardier and they're a lot less likely to you know, die if you put them in your display tank right away. So, you know, if you want to do that, that's up to you. Uh, they're usually eating a lot better than wild caught fish would be, and they haven't been on, you know, so many airplanes and then through a wholesaler where they might not have been getting enough to eat, you know, so they're a lot hardier than wild caught fish. And um, it's up to your risk aversion level if you really want to skip quarantine. Um, something that we have been talking about a lot lately in biota is the acclimation process. Um, I know that the drip acclimation is probably the most widely used and, and, and usually the one that people recommend the most. Um, and that's fine if you're getting fish from a local fish store, you know, a half an hour away, you get your fish, they bag it up and, and you're only driving a few minutes and there's no ammonia in the bag. So it's, you know, it's not really a big deal how you acclimate. Um, but when you're getting a fish shipped overnight to you, there's going to be ammonia in the bag. Um, and that's normal, expected. We, you know, that's going to happen. Um, but as the ammonia increases in the shipping water, the pH naturally decreases. You know, the CO2 goes up, the ammonia goes up, and then the pH comes down as a result. What happens when pH drops? Uh, the ammonia becomes less toxic. Ammonia toxicity decreases as ammonia, or as, uh, I'm sorry, as pH decreases. So when you start drip acclimating a new fish that came overnight, the pH from your main tank is going to increase the pH in the shipping water. And that's going to increase the toxicity of the ammonia. And it happens pretty rapidly, happens pretty seriously in, in some cases. Uh, so we don't recommend drip acclimating and there are a number of other reasons that drip acclimating a fish that's shipped overnight can be extra stressful on them. I mean, you're, a lot of times people put the bucket on the floor and it's a completely different temperature than the tank water is by the time they're ready to put it in. You know, so, and, and they're sitting in this, this stagnant water for you know, an hour and just getting more and more stressed out after being shipped. So what we like you to do is float your bags, for 15 minutes just to get the temperature regulated, cut them open, and net the fish out, put it in the tank. And that's it. And um, honestly, I use that procedure for most fish. Um, I don't really drip acclimate anymore. And this was something that I tested out when I was working in fish stores. And I found that when we did the cut and dump method, that we had less losses than when we did drip acclimating. So it was kind of a, it was a good thing because it saved us so much time and it saved stress on the fish and we had less losses. So I've kind of, I've done this method for a long time. Um, it was actually Dan Underwood at Seahorse Source like 15 years ago who told me about this 
who explained this whole thing to me, like, don't drip acclimate my seahorses when you get them. <laughs> so, and we have, Biota, we have this acclimation method on our website under the FAQs, if anybody wants to see it. So the big question is, do you really need to quarantine captive bred fish? Um, and I always talk about risk aversion level, because that's important. And, you know, a lot of people are comfortable with just having an asymptomatic fake infection in their tank forever and running UV sterilizers. Okay, that's up to you. Um, some people aren't, you know, uh, I'm the kind of person that I don't want to take any risks at all with that. So I prefer to quarantine and condition everything that comes in my house. Um, but if you, if you're somewhere in the middle and you're not sure what to do, um, just question, you know, where did the fish come from? Uh, did it come straight from the breeder? If it came straight to you from the breeder, then it probably doesn't have anything. It's probably not carrying anything. And you can put it right into your tank if you want to, if you're comfortable doing that. Um, if you got it from your fish store, ask yourself, was it in the same system as the wild caught fish? If it was, then it probably is carrying something. How long was it in the system with the other wild caught fish? Um, if it was only a few hours, it's probably probably okay, maybe a little less okay than if it came straight from the breeder, but it's up to you, uh, whatever you're comfortable with, your risk aversion level, but I'm always going to personally condition and then quarantine and then treat my fish. Um, and even if you don't want to prophylactically treat your fish, ideally you're going to condition your fish first. I just I think that that's the way to go. And I know the last thing a lot of people want in their house is an ugly tank that they can't really do anything else with, but it's not too hard. Um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with what a proper quarantine tank should be. Um, I hear a lot of people on forums say, well, I, I don't wanna keep my fish in the quarantine tank for too long. I'm only gonna do it for you know, a few days or a couple weeks because it's just, it's, it's better to get them into this, into the display right away where it's safer. But if your quarantine tank isn't safe, you're doing it wrong. You know, you're, this should be the safest place for your brand new fish to be in. So if you're having trouble getting fish through quarantine, you need to go back to humble fish, go on the forums and read a lot more and try to get really comfortable with setting up a proper quarantine tank conditioning slash quarantine. And do I practice what I preach? I do, this is my conditioning system. This is, this is not my medication system, but it is where I condition all of my new fish, even Acropora, I have a clam in there right now. Everything that comes into my house goes through this conditioning system first. It's uh, seven feet tall. The sump is four feet by two feet. And uh, it used to be an invert system at my local fish shop and I love it. This is one of my favorite systems, even though it's not pretty. And I typically don't have coral and fish in here at the same time if I plan to move the coral to another display because I don't wanna uh, risk it being transferred on the invert to the corals. So I try to plan things, you know, I don't rush anything. You know, so, it's a good idea to plan, okay, well, this shipment's going to come this time, and I want to wait at least a month or six weeks before putting fish, uh, and I try to let it go fallow before putting new fish in after the old fish left, etc. You know what I mean? Um, and it has a big UV sterilizer. It's got a 40-watt UV sterilizer on it, and the the water goes through the UV sterilizer before being returned to each row, which is really nice. So I know not everybody can do something like this, but if you can just do even a simple conditioning system before you start uh, treating your fish with medication, you'll see a lot less losses over time. And if you absolutely can't, condition or quarantine your fish in a separate system, but you 
at least want to separate them from, you know, bullies in your main tank. Um, I have one of these little acrylic acclimation boxes. I love this one. I got it from Marine Depot a long time ago. And I'm actually, I have some antheus in there that I'm separating from the main tank for a little while. And uh, maybe once they get a little more size to them, I'm gonna let them out. And it, you can't really say how long that's gonna take. You just have to observe your fish. And you, know, you can't say, well, it's gonna take you know, two weeks or six weeks. It's, you, know, you just have to observe them and their behavior and their growth and their body condition. And I know a lot of people are in a rush to get fish into their main tank, um, but I really wish that people would condition their new fish before treating them prophylactically. And um, should you treat captive bred fish for ick? Um, this is, it's a big question. And again, it's really up to you and your risk aversion level. Um, but if they're coming directly from the breeding facility, they're probably not carrying it. Um, you know, were they in a system with wild caught fish? And the thing is with these really young fish that are captive bred, copper is going to affect them a little differently than an adult fish, a wild caught adult fish. Um, while they're still growing, uh, the lateral line is more sensitive. So if you're coppering a brand new, young, captive bred yellow tang, any disruption in uh, you know, the, the stress level or the, the growing of, of this really young fish can cause marine head and lateral line erosion. So um, copper is a big reason for why we see that lateral line erosion in these really young fish. So if you have to use an eradication method, you know, maybe consider one of the more gentle methods on these really young fish. And if your captive bred fish comes to you already sick, like you got it from a local shop and uh, it unfortunately you know, got ick or something with the other wild caught fish, um, you know, again, just take it slow. Uh, depending on what the ailment is, you can always ask the humble fish forms for help. And um, before medicating, you know, just try to remember that these are young fish. So keep in mind that they have a different tolerance level for certain medications like these yellow tangs do. So it's not just because they're captive bred, it's because they're young and they're still growing. Um, and I think the mistake that a lot of people make in a hospital tank is that they're not siphoning after and before each feeding um, or monitoring the ammonia as well. And um, when fish are being medicated, they tend to lose a lot of weight sometimes. So make sure your fish is eating well, feed it frequently, and clean up after it. You have to try to keep that body condition good while you're medicating. Um, because if they get too weak, you'll just lose them. So it's a fine balance between, you know, trying to get rid of the, the ailment and also keeping their body condition good enough to, to keep them healthy. Um, I just thought you might want to see some pretty pictures of some biota captive bred tangs. These two were sent in by customers recently. I think this one uh, was from Jason. And this one's from Matt. Thanks, guys. And more pretty pictures. That's not really the prettiest picture. That's a recent picture of my main display tank. And these two, these are my two babies. I do keep some wild caught fish, not a lot of wild caught fish, but uh, this is my gem tank and my joculator angel fish. And um, the gem tank came from TSM Aquatics, where they they go through the the, uh, the prophylactic copper eradication method. But 
I still quarantined and conditioned my fish first. I think I quarantined Gem Tang here for about three months. I wanted to get his body condition really great. And I decided to go through the ick eradication method again anyway, just to be double safe. And that's just my personal preference. You know, not everybody's gonna do that, but I trust PSM, um, but I still, I wanted to make sure. And here are some my, my some of my captive bred babies. These are from Biota. Um, this is Dunk Truck, the rabbit fish. We had a naming contest a few weeks ago and uh, the people have spoken. His name is Dump Truck. And this is a flathead perch from Australia. Well, the brood starts from Australia, but he's a captive bred from North Carolina. And uh, one of my pink square anthias, they're the ones that are currently in the acclimation box in the display tank. Uh, Starry Goby. And Fang Glenny, I love this little guy. He's really personable and um, court jester Gobi. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm probably just literally preaching to the choir with everybody here. You guys are probably like, we all do this. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of misconceptions. I think a lot of people don't know how to handle quarantining and or observing um, captive bred fish. So this this probably clears up a lot of the um, the misperceptions. Um, I think the takeaway I want is we really need to go slow and condition our fish first before we rush on to medicating them. You know, people get new fish and they just want to medicate them right away. And yeah, I think if we, you know, do this process, go slow, condition, and then medicate, we're going to see a lot less losses. And that's something that we need to be paying attention to in our hobby. We need to be more ethical and sustainable in our keeping. Yeah, exactly. I've run into species that, for example, there's certain species that are intolerant of chloroquine, but I found oh, yeah. that when I precondition them for two or three weeks, uh, flash or asses, antheus, and I actually power feed them, precondition them, and then run them through the medication. These fish that were normally intolerant actually go through the, the treatment just fine. So yeah, that echoes what you're saying. You know, I'm wishing now I had put a couple pictures of, you know, of what a fish looks like when it's too thin and what a really well-conditioned, good body conditioned fish looks like, because it seems like a lot of newer hobbyists they're so used to seeing fish in the shops that are wild and then have spent a lot of time in transit. They're used to seeing skinny fish. So they don't realize that that's not normal. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. That the fish needs to be plump, you know, yes. not, not skinny, not emaciated. So, so we, we have some, if you have time, we have some questions here. Um, I know, you know, we're on a little bit of a time constraint here, so we don't want to like tie up your entire afternoon. And so I just want everyone that, that is listening right now to understand that, you know, we're trying to answer all the questions that you posted, but you know, there are some time constraints here. So, but let's get to some of the questions if, if that's okay. Sure. So I guess the first question here is what's the biggest misconception you encounter regarding captive breadfish? Um, I asked Jake, He's the marine biologist in Florida. A lot of these questions too. So I'm gonna give my answer and Jake's answer also if he answered them. Um, so I said, I think the biggest misconception is that captive breadfish are 100% disease free all the time. I've had a lot of people message me and say, I don't understand, you know, my, my captive breadfish has ick. And I thought that, you know, they were disease free all the time. And I would ask, okay, well, where did it come from? Like, oh, well, I got it from my local shop. Okay. So yes, they're a lot less likely to be carrying any kind of infection. Um, but you just have, you know, you guys all know, you have to think about, well, has it ever been, you know, with any wild caught fish? Um, and then people say, well, I did get it direct from the breeder, but when I put it in my display tank, it got it, but none of my other fish got it. So they think that the new fish is the one that brought the it, when really their existing fish 
that they've had for five years that never showed any symptoms were just asymptomatic carriers. And the new fish being stressed out now is symptomatic. So I think that's a big misconception. Um, and while, uh, you know, these, these marine biologists, they're, they take biosecurity very seriously. Uh, they have you know, a very valuable fish in these systems and they don't want to have anything happen to them. But like uh, Jake always says, he, he quotes Jeff Goldblum from uh, Jurassic Park, life uh, finds a way. So sometimes things happen, but it's a lot less likely with captive bred. Um, Jake's answer was awesome, I thought. He says, uh, the biggest misconception about captive bred fish is around the pricing. A lot of hobbyists and store owners compare captive bred to wild caught fish and it really diminishes the animal's value. Not only is it the captive bred, an aquarium ready fish, um, each fish is cared for for months from egg to sellable size uh, so that they thrive in home aquariums. It's basically a completely different com product when compared side by side. Um, it also discounts the fact that we know how old the fish are and they're primed to live out their full lives in your aquarium, whether that's 20 plus years for a tang or five to six years for a court jester, you know you have the ability to see this animal throughout its entire life. And it's a really nice pet for your family. And uh, he says on the, there's an entire other side of the industry that believes captive bred fish are somehow inferior to wild caught. Um, he says, I'm not sure where that really comes from, um, but he says, we're seeing, and we are, we do see this, that fish that have been in home aquariums for years from uh, captive bred are indistinguishable from wild fish. Do captive bred fish have better immune systems compared to wild caught? And I think sometimes the assumption is because wild caught are exposed to pathogens at a at a sublethal concentration in the, own, in the ocean, their immune systems, you know, gain familiarity and they develop resistance to it. But, you know, uh, these captive bred fish are, are I don't want to say they're, they're bred in sterile environments, but probably pathogen free. So I guess how do their immune systems uh, compare to their wild caught, caught counterparts? Honestly, I'm probably not qualified to answer this question. I don't have a marine biology degree. I'm not an immunologist, but from experience, what most of us have seen is that because wild caught food or wild caught fish are so stressed out, spending so much time in transit, not getting the proper nutrition while they're in transit, they are the ones who have a seriously compromised immune system by the time they get to your home. So just having captive bred fish that are already really well conditioned and eating well when they get to your home. They, they don't, they don't have as, they don't have periods of intense stress in their lives that are going to weaken their immune system. Yeah, a lot of the fish that we see in, you know, shops, when you look at them, I mean, they're, they're dead and they don't know it yet. You know what I mean? And then you put them in your tank and, and, and that's all it takes. So you're saying that basically the conditioning that they receive at the facility kind of offsets the that, that, that they don't have any, you know, encounters with pathogens in the wild because they're being conditioned and because they're being conditioned and their immune system is basically fed from their gut, then they ha should have a good, strong resistance to pathogens. I think that's, uh, yes, that's a great way to say it. So outside of clownfish, what would be a good starter fish to learn how to get, um, you know, if you wanted to start breeding, you know, it seems like everybody and their brother nowadays is um, breeding clownfish, but what about if you wanted to try a different fish in different species, what would be your rec suggestion? I suggested seahorses. Um, seahorses are different from other fish, but so there's a little bit of a learning curve. Like I try to say like, okay, forget what you know about reef fish and then read about seahorses and you'll be more successful. But once you get past that initial learning curve, seahorses are so ridiculously easy to breed and raise. Um, they eat newly hatched artemia from day one. 
it, it's amazing. And dwarf seahorses, if you don't mind never going on vacation again, because you have to hatch live food for them every day, you can actually keep dwarf seahorse fry in the same tank as the adults for their whole lives. So they're basically like guppies. And Jake says he thinks the best starter fish are uh, things that are demersal spawners or mouth brooders like cardinal fish. Um, cardinals are mouth brooders. The larvae are large enough size to feed uh, many readily available live feeds or micro diets, but the downside is it's pretty difficult to get the egg masses from the parents without stressing them out. Let's see, he says, but if you want to start breeding something, Jake suggests getting a simple 10 gallon or 20 gallon setup with no substrate, PVC, controllable heater and light systems, and feed the fish four to five times a day with a diet high in fatty acids and vitamins. Uh, there are so many species of gobies and damsels that haven't been bred yet that could use some attention and love. Next question, someone asked about uh, where are the lemon butterflies at? And I think everyone probably would be interested in, in captive bred butterfly fish in general because the wild caught specimens, they're, they're sometimes so difficult to get eating in captivity. Uh, I mean, I'm a butterfly guy. I love butterfly fish, but you know, even my success rate is not very good with them. So uh, I guess, what about lemon butterflies and other butterfly fish? Jake says, so I've only been at Biota for a couple months now and I'm loving it so far. This, I really believe in their their, uh, their dream. And, but I don't know all the behind the scenes things. So I did have to ask Jake a lot of these questions. He says, we're working on getting more batches of them. The first few batches sold out much more quickly than anticipated and the demand is pretty high. Our Hawaii facility has been incredibly busy at increasing the production of yellow tang to meet the demand. And we haven't had the space for larval cleaner grass, butterflies and potters like we anticipated. We're finally in a place where those experiments and trials are either currently running or about to be running. So we can expect more, hopefully in the next six to eight months. So that's awesome. Here's another good question that was submitted. Um, how do you suggest quarantining captive bred fish that come direct from the facility? So if it's coming direct from Biota or even let's just say another um, captive bred facility, it's not going through a wholesale or a local fish store. How do you recommend quarantining and or conditioning that fish? Um, I think we went over that in the presentation pretty well, but again, it's up to your personal risk aversion level. Um, if you want to be as perfect as you can be, ideally you would get them in and condition them first and then uh, do a prophylactic treatment if you wanted to, considering their age and sensitivity to medication. Um, tank transfer is, is pretty gentle. Um, but if you're not worried about uh, transferring disease to your existing fish, uh, sure, you can put them right into your main tank if you're comfortable doing that, but I'm not, I'm not. Um, and you also have to consider that new fish even if they're captive bred, you know, they're still brand new and uh, they might like to have a rest period before going into the display. Um, Jake says he suggests a monitoring period in a quarantine tank. Um, shipping can be stressful, so it's good to have a receiving tank away from your display that isn't medicated but has the possibility to run medication. Jake says we're very confident in our biosecurity at our facility, but we also understand that sometimes life finds a way. Um, he usually advocates against prophylactic treatments, especially on newly received fish, regardless if they're captive bred or wild caught. Um, we share, Jake and I share similar ideas. I like that. Um, he definitely does not recommend treating the yellow tanks with copper specifically because uh, marine had lateral line erosion. Um, and there, he says, since they're young and they are growing pretty quickly, it tends to damage their lateral line if they are extensively stressed during this period of time. So yeah, like you said, it all pretty much comes down to your tolerance for risk. You know, whether or not you want to quarantine, observe, or just put the fish right in your in your DT. Um, 
Here's another one. If I buy a male and female pair of fish from the same facility and they breed, will the offspring have genetic issues due to inbreeding? Short answer is no. The long answer is also no, but with more steps. Uh, basically, we take genetics very seriously at Biota. So with many of our broodstock, they're F1 and F2 from different parents. So there's no relation or inbreeding. This also prevents any genetic bottlenecking or genetic diseases due to inbreeding. And he says it's future proofing. Uh, many of our clutches are mixed if they are spawning in the same time period. Many fish spawn based on moon cycles. So there's almost no way of telling if they're going to be a pair from the same clutch. Even if they are related, it's highly unlikely you'll see any significant genetic issues or deformities in first generation inbreeding. We see it so often with clownfish because some of those broodstock pairs can be selected batch by batch throughout generations to get the designer outcome and they sexually mature fairly quickly. So it's, it's easy to continue that inbreeding process over and over and over again. Here's another one. Out of the approximate 64 to 68 fish listed on the public face facing portal, what sets the priority on availability or breeding list? And this was a question for Jake. And he says the priority is set by a few different factors, but a lot depends on demand from customers and the possibility of scaling up. We take a lot of feedback from customers and what they're looking for in the marketplace or where there are shortcomings. One of our most popular fish is the Port Jester Gobi because wild pup populations almost certainly die in home aquaria from starvation, but they're great hair algae eaters and just generally really cool fish. Um, this was the same model for why we breed mandarins, since wild pop populations are usually inhumanely caught with microspheres and then starve most of the time. If we could cut down on unnecessary deaths in the aquarium trade even a little bit, it's a great reason to breed a fish, and I agree. Um, another aspect we factor in is the research side of the equation. If a fish is generally abundant at one of our facility locations, they're a good option as a pioneer species to gain insight into many other species in that same family. That's one of the reasons why we breed yellow tangs, coral beauties, and royal grandmas. The research helps us branch out and use what we've learned on some of the harder to breed members of that family. And finally, we're also fish nerds here, and many of us have species that we've always hoped to breed. Jake says his is the Ventralis anthias and the dwarf red wasp fish. Um, Tom loves regal angelfish and white cat gobies. Those are his dreams. And Felicia's personal holy grail captive bred fish would be flashing tilefish. That's the fish I most want to see captive bred. As a lot of the fish on the public portal are sold out, what is the limiting factor for production? Is this a real estate, holding tank, staff, or some other issue? It depends on the species, but a lot of the species only spawn during certain times of the year or during specific cycles. Um, a good example is the blotched anthias. They need a long temperature cycle to breed again, or getting broodstock from that species may be hard to come by or hard to condition to become breeding in captivity. Um, to get some species into true commercial numbers, it can be a space issue. We're always growing each one of our facilities, but producing many of these fish in large enough quantities can be limited by the amount of tank space we have or even the size of the larval tanks. The next question is, post-production size, is it possible to offer larger fish, but with a higher cost to offset the additional food and storage space? I guess some people you know, like kind of like you were saying, you were putting fish in um, um, a box, an acclimation box until they got to the right size, until you were comfortable releasing them into your display tank. Um, so is it possible that down the road that uh, people could buy larger fish so they could go right into the DT without having to go through that? There are going to be uh, some larger yellow tanks coming up in the near future. I will say that. Um, but Jake says something that I wasn't expecting him to say and that I didn't know. So he says, there's a balance here that can be hard to flirt with. Uh, with species like our mandarin, they take around seven months to get to that small size we sell them at. So we're already selling them at a discount of what the true cost of production is on them. That was a big aha moment for me. Um, but once they're in a home aquarium, 
out of competing with each other for space and food, they usually explode in size fairly quickly. And customers have told me that, that they do grow really quickly once you get them. All of this fish we sell at the sizing we sell them at are at that size because they will thrive in home aquariums and we've tested it. I know every aquarium can vary. Um, with gobies, blennies, damsels, filefish, et cetera, it's typically not a problem, but I know many customers add our yellow tanks and angelfish to already established tanks with very large angels and tanks that have their own territory, and um, that can cause a problem. But we hope to have larger size of yellow tanks available closer to winter, but holding a small percentage of our yellow tanks back on each batch. Growth rates do vary among all the species we breed, so it can be hard to find that balance, especially when many of the reason to not purchase our fish has come down to pricing. It may be hard to justify added pricing on a larger fish. Uh, this next question that was submitted is a little bit of a, a curveball, but here we go. Do you have any lessons learned, best practices, or game changers that are uh, applicable to hobbyists for species that are still wild caught, not captive bred? I think this one was mainly about fish that were difficult to get eating in captivity. Like there was a first part to the question that I, I wasn't comfortable answering. Um, we got the, I'm sorry, we got this question late and uh, Jake was putting away a shipment late last night. So he might have actually answered it and I'll try to put it in the forum if he did. Um, but I don't really know how they do it at Biota, but I assume it's something similar to what I have always done. Um, but I've always been interested in fish like that, that are difficult to get eating in captivity. Like I started out with pipefish and seahorses and I had a sea moth 15 years ago in tilefish. And, um, what I learned in the seahorse community is what I apply to getting these difficult live food eaters to eat prepared foods in captivity. Um, but I think the most important part is finding a specimen that's still in good shape because a lot of times these live food eaters, uh, when you see them in the shops, they're, they're already gone and they just don't know it yet. They're too far gone. Even if you take them home and do everything right, it's too late. And that's really sad, but if you can find one that is in really good shape, um, quarantine them in a boring bare bottom tank. You need to make sure that they can see the food, that they have to pay attention to the food, um, that the food doesn't just float around the tank and get lost in the rocks. Um, and we found in the seahorse community that was one of the best ways to get these live food, or food eaters interested is just have them in a boring bare bottom tank. Painting the bottom black also helps them see um, if it's a really difficult species, like a sea moth. What I had to do was, um, first I, I was offering it live foods that it was already used to. So um, we had live shrimp, live mysis that I was offering it. And I was at a facility at the time where I had access to that. So I know not everybody does. So we got them eating live, my, or the live mice, and then I would freeze some of them and then thaw them and give them to him dead, mix them in with some of the live mice that he was used to eating. And he eventually started eating some of the dead ones. And then eventually uh, he, I started mixing in, you know, PE frozen mice along with the mix of live mice and he would start eating all of that. Um, it's very time consuming, very difficult, and probably not worth it in most cases um, for these difficult live food eaters. But you just, you have to be persistent, feed them at least three times a day or more, siphon before and after each feeding. Um, and I, I'm not really a fan of garlic for treating disease, but it does have a place. And just anecdotally, what I've noticed is um, when I would uh, soak uh, foods in garlic that the fish were already used to eating. That was kind of like a Pavlov's bell for them. So when I started soaking dead food, you know, like frozen mysis in the garlic, they would recognize that and it would, they'd be more likely to eat it. So just a personal anecdote. Yeah, exactly. I mean, hey, uh, if a fish will eat garlic soaked food, that's better than a fish that's eating nothing. So, you know, if it serves as an appetite stimulant, you know, that's, that's great, you know. 
So here's another question. Um, are there any diseases or pathogens that can be shared between people and fish? Should we, we be washing our hands before putting them in the fish tank? So this one, I'm probably not qualified to answer it, but I'll answer it anyway, because um, you know I have some experience with this, but yes. Um, People do get mycobacteria, vibrio from their fish tanks. And a really good friend of mine recently, um, he's been in the hospital since September 20th and he's still there right now. He's in pretty bad shape. Um, I'm gonna butcher the name, but he got a really serious erysipelas ruciopathiae infection from his tank. And um, of course he's one in a million and probably one of the first people, if not the first person to ever have this documented. Um, but they, uh, the hospital, they, they did culture the bacteria, they sent it out to a lab and that's what they identified it as. So he's been asking me, hey, ask around, ask people, does anybody else know about this? Um, you know, uh, what I found was I found one article from a few years ago from the shed aquarium who had some marine mammals die from this infection. So I thought that was interesting, um, but it is really rare for this to happen. And um, it was shocking because he is, uh, he's a really good fish keeper and I've seen his tanks and they're not dirty or anything. Um, it was just a, a fluke, a freak accident. Um, and the question whether or not you can pass diseases onto your fish. Very, 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 very unlikely. I don't think that's ever happened, but we should be washing our hands before we put them in our tanks, but mostly just to remove any chemicals or debris. Um, but unless you have cholera right now, you're probably not going to give your fish any diseases. Excellent, excellent answer. Um, so next question is now that yellow tang breeding is full scale, are there any plans for designer tangs? Like, are we going to start seeing long fin yellow tangs or anything like that coming out of biota? We, we did have one yellow tang that was white and we kept it for a while and we thought it was going to be a cool fish, but it turned out it was just a late bloomer that took a really long time turning yellow. Um, it's amazing the difference in how soon or late they turn yellow. It's all different depending on individuals. Um, but anyway, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't offer like aberrant fish to the hobby if they appeared spontaneously. I and mean, we already have uh, the platinum Dijangai that spontaneously appeared in our uh, populations. Um, but I think I'm going to say, I, we haven't really talked about it, but I know these guys, and I imagine we're all on the same page about not breeding fish that have just debilitating abnormalities, like, you know, the brachycephalic smashed in face or fish that have no tails. I, we're all, you know, conservationists, and we're, I think we're all pretty uncomfortable with stuff like that. But you might see some aberrant colored fish. Uh, the last question that I have, it's a little long, so bear with me here. Person asks, I have a six month old captive bread tank from Biota and it appears to have a bit of HLLE around the eyes and nose. When it arrived, it had very little yellow, so these spots just never filled in. What makes captive bread tanks more susceptible to this issue and what can be done to counteract, counteract it? Like we talked about earlier, it's not because they're captive bread, it's because they're young. So um, you know, these very young fish, any disruption or stress that they have in their lives when the, that lateral line is developing can disrupt that and cause damage to the lateral line. Um, it's tough to say what caused it exactly. There are a lot of things that can cause you know, marine head lateral line erosion. Um, it wouldn't hurt to check and make sure you don't know, have stray voltage, um, but you're on the right track feeding, you know, um, vitamins and highly unsaturated fatty acid supplements. Those are really important. And it's possible that over time, the lateral line could heal. I've seen that happen. It can take a long time though. Um, I've seen fish that were absolutely just hideous, just really serious lateral line erosion, even the fins. And I've seen those fish heal over time with 
you know, when you remove the stressor that causes it, they can eventually heal and become almost perfect. Um, but usually when we see our captive red tangs with lateral line issues, uh, recently it's been because they spent some time in popper medication either at the store or at the hobbyists. Um, but it can also be for other common reasons like stray voltage, nutritional deficiency, carbon, water quality, et cetera. I, I see Jake is here now. Oh, okay. Maybe Jake would like to chime in. Hi. There he is. <laughs> Hi, so sorry He's about an that. Actual marine biologist, guys. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually just got a shipman today, so I was in the process of unbagging them. I just finished uh, a ton of uh, truma, tree bottom, the red belly trumas just came in, so that was the last thing they had to unbag. <laughs> oh, so what was our question? Um, oh. It was about captive bred purple tangs and. Um, uh, hippo tanks. So the purple tanks are from um, a partner of ours, uh, Mr. Sue at Bali Eckridge, um, and he only kind of gets them seasonally. The way that he breeds things is a, is a bit different from the way we breed things, so it's a little bit more inconsistent, but we get batches of really cool species, um, like the purple tang, the, the multi-bar angels, uh, and just kind of cool stuff kind of out of left field sometimes. I know he's in Cuban hogfish and, and just kind of cool stuff, um, Australian hogs. Um, but for the uh, hippo tangs, we've been working on them for uh, almost two years now, um, and we have gotten them into commercial numbers, but we haven't gotten them to a point where we're happy enough with their coloration and sizing um, that we can sell them. So we are still working on the research on them, um, but like the um, original research on the, uh, the yellow tangs when OI first started, I believe in 2013 or 15 or something like that, um, a lot of the first batches had um, that head and lateral line disease. Um, and so we're trying to prevent getting that into the market because we want to make sure that everyone gets um, like a perfect fish. Um, so we are doing some trials. It looks like the, the one of the biggest factors with those guys is actually a vitamin D deficiency um, with just natural sunlight. Um, so the ones that we have um, and grow out outside um, are showing basically little to no uh, head and lateral line disease, but the ones that we have indoors under just LEDs um, actually show a little bit more. Um, so that's kind of the limiting factor right now. We hope to get them to market. Um, we keep kind of pushing it back a little bit, little bit, just to to make sure we have a perfect uh, product going to market. But we are working on them. Liz earlier was had her hands up, but I don't know if she still want to ask or not. Besides that, well, I was just going to thank Felicia thank for. You reminding everyone about the ammonia in the shipment bag issue. So I think it's it's a major problem. We still see on the forums these um, like parking lot sales where someone will split a wholesale order and people just don't understand when your, your fish has been in the bag that long. The ammonia is very high, but it's okay because the pH is so low in the bag. But the second you open the bag, the ammonia spikes. And we see it on the forum. Some will say, we, you know, I bought a fish in a parking lot sale. It's shipped direct. They think they're getting a better deal because it's shipped direct from Indonesia or wherever. But then two weeks later, after the fish looks okay, it just suddenly declines because it had some kind of internal damage from that initial ammonia exposure. So thanks for bringing that up. And I think we should um, kind of spread the word more on the forums. Yeah, I hear a lot. I dripped it for three hours. I did the right thing. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I, I do have one question, though, and this is for you, Felicia or Jake. So, I mean, I, I'm, I practice the same thing. If I get a fish from a wholesaler or from a local fish store, I mean, I set my QT tank to salinity and temperature to match. I float, wait 15, 20 minutes, I release. However, I have gotten ship, shipments in from... Um, uh, overseas tra uh, trans shippers and things like that, where I noticed that the pH of the bag water was ridiculous, like five, 5.5, 5.0. And in that, those situations, I'll actually do, it's a very long process where I will do pH acclimation, where the fish will go, I use muratic acid to lower, the fish goes into a trough, I drip acclimate them into neutral water, and I then uh, drip acclimate from neutral water into alkaline water. Is that necessary or can fish go from acidic to alkaline without issue? I used to work at a wholesaler and that was something really common. You know, we would get fish from literally the other side of the world and they ship them in bags that were, you know, this big, like the fish was shipped in a teaspoon of water or something, it was ridiculous. 
and um, uh, it was Joe Russo actually, and he is one of the biggest fish nerds I've ever met in my life. So I trust his system and he had set up similar to what you do, just a very intense uh, acclimation process for getting these fish, you know, reacclimated to our systems. And it was constant testing with the pH pens, constant, constant, and you know, really similar to what you were doing with the bins and the dripping and the bailing and just, constant monitoring that took, I mean, sometimes we'd start work at 7 p.m. and we wouldn't get home until 7 a.m., you know, acclimating these fish all night long. But that's a little different from what most hobbyists are going to encounter, hopefully. Right. And I just want to point that out. I only do that if I'm receiving a fish from an overseas collector and the fish has been in transit for several days. Um, yeah, if I, if I get fish from the water. Yeah, yeah. And if, if the fish has been, you know, wholesaler, I go to a local fish store. I mean, I just float and release. I don't even worry about pH, but that, that, that was just a weird situation. I didn't know if anybody here sometimes gets fish from overseas collectors or not. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's it. Um, I mean, unless you want, so I had something else or, or Jake had something else to, to add um, to the presentation. Um, I was acclimating stuff for most of it, so I was only getting bits and pieces. Our, our fish room doesn't have uh, the best Wi-Fi, so I know I was kind of cutting in and out. But I, I'm sure Felicia did an amazing job um, answering all your questions and, and doing a good presentation. I'll have to watch it once it's uh, uploaded. One last thing that I wanted to know, somebody asked, and I think you might have answered it this morning, about um, the difficult broodstock, like the Mandarin broodstock. Somebody was asking, how did we get to the point where we can have this really difficult species breeding. Do you know um, the answer yeah, so to that? The, the cool kind of part about it is uh, Tom and the divers in Palau, they get to see these fish in their natural habitats. Um, so a lot of times they get to kind of mimic those um, in, to our best ability in, um, in, in, in captivity. And I, I think uh, when Felicia sent me this question, um, I, uh, the way I kind of answered it was also kind of diverting from the mandarins because I mean a lot of hobbyists can keep mandarins if they're hatching live feeds and doing all that um, but there's other species that we've worked with that are actually even more difficult like uh, we brought up uh, some of the first uh, Abe's angelfish um, in captivity and uh, the blotched anthias and things like that that are actually really difficult because they're deep water and they're not used to different lighting and temperatures and, and people or really any kind of activity because they're usually found that that really deep um, in the ocean. So I think the best thing is that our divers get to see the environments that these fish are like uh, acclimated to and, and try to do their best to make it as similar as possible, uh, whether that be dim lights, uh, whether it be the type of corals um, that they are interested in. I know at our, uh, at our Hawaii facility, the hippo tank broodstock is in, uh, there's a bunch of fake uh, Pacillopora um, and uh, Blue Ridge coral because I think in the wild, uh, specifically Blue Ridge Coral, the hippo tanks like to wedge themselves in. Um, just makes them a little bit more comfortable, makes them like survive a little bit better, especially during those first stressful couple of weeks or months when they're taken out of the wild or something like that. Um, but it's, it's just kind of making sure that you're doing the best of your ability to make sure that these fish are comfortable in a new environment. And that might be making like a whole tank for them, or it might be just making sure they're not getting beat up the second they <laughs> put in that tank. Well, we thank you, Jake, for joining us. And Felicia, you did an amazing job. It was an amazing presentation and, and uh, the Q&A session afterwards. And Biota is lucky to have you working for them. You, you're, you're a credit not only to the industry, uh, to the hobby, and we're very lucky to have you. And we're very lucky and fortunate that you um, agreed to do this presentation. So we thank you. Thanks for having me on. I had fun.